Okay. Well, despite the social distancing, I'm very thrilled to connect with you and also to join uh, in speaking with both my own students from the University of Washington, William Dew, you'll hear in a minute, and, and also wear my Microsoft hat. And uh, to have uh, my colleagues Malavika and Michael join me is a particular honor. So they'll be demonstrating some innovations that are recently launched or in private preview. I'll be demonstrating one of them myself. Uh, that has not yet received its final name. So you're going to hear about Project Cortex, which is still its code name. But first, um, I was asked to um, say a few things and seed our thinking about the future of work. And that's because last year I got to represent Microsoft on my second and third thought leadership papers uh, about the future of work, which we published in partnership with the Harvard Business Review. So since I've been a student of workplace futurism for about two years, then what you're seeing today, we can consider my master's thesis, and this is my defense. But um, so far, here's what I've learned. Contribute to contribute anything meaningful to the discussion of the future of work, you have to do one of three things. And the first thing that you have to do is you have to say something ridiculous. Uh, Jim Dater is uh, one of the founders of Foresights and Future Studies. He's based at the University of Hawaii. And this comment, I think, really captures a lot. If you say something that's already happening, then you're not making a real contribution. So let me say uh, my first ridiculous thing. Yes, in the future, we will all work for Barack Obama. Computing will be rainbows coming out of our hands, and the office will be a unicorn. So there you have it, my first ridiculous prediction about the future of work. Now, this points out the second way to make a contribution in this field, which is predict something that turns out to be wrong. Uh, and this is uh, very informative. And so the first wrong prediction that we'll just remind ourselves of is that, you know, by 2020, we were all supposed to have smart refrigerators. And of course, Samsung, you know, had, uh, uh, you know, um, offerings on the market at 2010. And of course, even CES just last year predicted, you know, it's right around the corner. Um, when a prediction is wrong, it teaches us about why it was wrong and what actually happened in the execution of that plan that slowed it down. I have to say, Akin, showing us the prediction from John Maynard Keynes about technological unemployment that he made in 1930 possibly could be considered another one of these wrong predictions about the future. But again, Everything that we predict that's wrong is incredibly informative. You know, and the last uh, way you make a contribution to this field, going back to Professor Jim Dater, is you just don't make a prediction at all. Um, because here it is, the father of futurism saying that, you know, the future does not exist. But what he is saying is that you should articulate a preferred future. And that's a future um, that you envision, you implement, you test, you reevaluate, you revise. And that is the true work of foresights and futurism, um, to show the leadership to articulate something, to persuade others to believe it, and then to continue to update it as we move along. So I think that um, that's probably uh, setting the stage for six predictions that we made in our last uh, thought leadership paper called The Future of Now that we did with Harvard Business Review. Uh, free PDFs are available online. I had hundreds of copies to give out in person today. So we will follow up with that and make sure that you can, you can read these in full. I wanna just walk through these six predictions here in the next three minutes, um, because I think you're gonna see them arise for sure in my own uh, uh, demonstration of the tools, as, as well as those demoing by Malavika and by Michael, and probably by William and probably all day long. So very quickly, and let me add a little bit of thought to each of these. So technology and human beings will become collaborators. Now, in our study, two thirds of the business leaders that we surveyed um, believe that AI and machine learning will create more jobs than they eliminate. Uh, and there is some history to corroborate this view. There are in fact more banking tellers today than there were before the automated teller machine was invented. And I, I, had, I recommend that you look closely at those analyses. So if AI increases the size of the workforce rather than replaces jobs, it means that we'll be working and it means that we'll be working alongside intelligent agents. Now, I think we've been hearing about this already that we'll be training them, but you know, we'll be doing a lot more than that. We'll be looking at their recommendations and scrutinizing them and approving them. Um, we might be responding to their analyses or their notifications. Um, a lot of times we'll be editing their writing uh, in the future. 
But one thing in the preferred future is that we will rely on them, and that is to do the work that we want to do. Number two, ambient technology will conform to human behavior. This is a future I very much want to see. I argue that computers in the workplace for too long have made us act like computers. All the forms, all the pull downs, all the tabbing, all the submitting, you know, from office space, those TPS reports that our boss needs ASAP, that'd be great. You know, artificial intelligence, I believe, will paradoxically return to us our authentic humanity. We'll get our voices back in the way we work. We'll get our fingers. We'll pull out of these tiny screens and we'll move about. We won't hunt through directories for documents. We'll ask for things and then we'll share our own knowledge. Uh, and, and, and we'll talk to our coworkers and in the future, we'll talk to them regardless of their language of origin. Number three, data democratization will empower more employees to make strategic decisions. You know, today, whether we work in the office or at the first line, you know, working, meeting our customers' needs or at the front line making our products, we just don't realize how much we realize. We don't know how much we know. It's estimated that 75% of the world's data sits inside company firewalls in unused corners of data lakes and data warehouses. When that data is brought out with the help of AI, any of us can become a consultant to the C-suite and all of us will be able to change things for the better. And that's the de democratization that, that we wanna look forward to. Moving on, are you with me? Number four, employees will turn to dynamic talent networks to get work done. So in the 1980s, academics in organizational design in those disciplines first articulated the problem of finding experts and finding expertise inside a large organization. And then computer science picked this up as a problem that they tried to compute around and solve around the 2000s. But you know, still today, how would I find all of the futurists at Microsoft? How would I find all of the futurists here at the University of Washington? You know, I think the answer still would be a shockingly ancient process, word of mouth, um, you know, as if we're all working in a Neanderthal village or something. Well, when this problem of finding experts and finding expertise is solved, and I want, I want to say that this is imminent futurism. Microsoft believes it's solved already using the Microsoft graph, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But when it is solved, it is true that we'll be able to create talent teams seamlessly. And when that happens, where we have a radical meritocracy of who we need and who has the expertise to get done what needs to get done, Yes, we will have to rethink and reevaluate all of our cubicle walls. We'll have to rethink our org charts. We'll have to rethink W2 forms and international boundaries because all of that will very much melt away. Okay, number five, corporate cultures will prioritize workplace technology. I think this is perhaps one of the most abstract ones, but clearly one of the most important. You know, one of Satya Nadella's favorite quotes, and he's the CEO of Microsoft, is that Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, uh, uh, forgive me if I just sort of show an image of that thought. But, you know, even Satya could not have predicted what happens when you bring cultural consciousness and today's technologies together. So collaboration tools like this. For you yesterday, this was a convenience. You wanted to work from home in your pajamas. Today, it is a solution for people that, fighting a pandemic. Obviously, collaboration tools like we're having here means something really different to people who are out on parental leave, but still wanna have a seat at the table. You know, computer vision means something different to people who have no vision. Uh, and I've seen some demonstrations of things that really are, are just life changers. You know, and this is the thought of inclusive design, which proves that when we design for everyone, we all win. So the merger of, of, of culture and cultural consciousness with these technologies is what's gonna help us retain our, our employees, retain our talent and just really make magic. You know, and finally security, privacy and the elimination of bias will underlie everything. You know, I think um, in the last few years, there's been a painful ethical maturity that has come to technology. I know those of us who care about UX and working in that field, you know, we were laboring under this illusion that we could do nothing but good. 
And then we realize that our same skills could be used to exploit human nature as well as align with it. I am actually pleased to say that the ethical maturity in AI is happening far quicker. They're developing their review boards. They're figuring out their values. They're making decisions. They're leaving money on the table against those values. So, you know, security and privacy, and I'm putting, you know, this ethics together with that, they were never going to come to us without hard choices that we make against clear values. You know, but the prediction for the future that I will make is that technologies that don't have security, privacy, and the elimination of bias, they just won't thrive. You, many of you know that I wrote a book titled Bottlenecks, and this is my word for that incredible, powerful force that users have to either be receptive to a new technology or to reject it. And we know with AI that that is a very rapid process and a very powerful one, but I think it's a creative one. I think that's the force that will shape this technology to be a prefer preferred future, not the future you know, that, that, that we fear and have feared forever. So communication leaders you know, who are clear-eyed about all this will be able to shape it. Okay, so moving very quickly, I wanted to just pop over and show you a quick product that um, is one of the many that are coming out um, leveraging the Microsoft graph. Um, and really, I, I, I wanna display one more graphic to help you understand what the Microsoft, Microsoft graph is. Now you understand because you're a user of social media that they're networks and that people in network terminology are nodes and their friendships or their likes or their follows are the links. And that together that makes a network and a network is a very, very powerful system for storing repositories of knowledge. Well, when um, we start to make products on the networks that exist inside companies, first of all, you find that there's far more knowledge and there's far more nuance to them. Inside a company, we are networked by who we are CC'd on an email with. There is a network of who we went to a meeting with. There is a network of who read our work products. Um, and all of these are networks layered upon networks that can be used to create incredible richness and what Satya Nadella is calling knowledge, actual knowledge creation. So, you know, the demo is just simply that say you're in a Teams chat or any kind of chat or an email and someone uses a term you don't know, like Mark 8. What's Mark 8? What's Project Core? Now, this is the start of the first product I want to show you about called Project Cortex. And these are topic cards uh, that are out in your everyday work streams that are telling you with definitions and finding the experts and finding the documents that are related to that. Um, now, the most important thing probably to realize about these cards is that they're not written by humans. They're written by AI. And that's AI that's reasoning over the Microsoft graph and then pulling it together to create knowledge out of data. So if you click on these, like I said, the problem of finding expertise is something that is solved. Um, reasoning over the network inside of your company, you see that Nestor and Lynn and Grady and Henrietta are all experts on this particular topic. Um, there are the documents that can get you ramped up. If this takes hold, then very quickly we will be, um, you know, we will be rapidly learning what everyone in the in the company can know. There's something else that's um, also quite magical about this, which is the AI can construct um, semantic maps of related topics. So, in addition, Mark Eight is related to this construction operations reliability in this example. And that might be the thing that would take a long time and a lot of human interaction to realize, oh, and this is also related to GIS mapping and structural integrity. But AI is connecting um, topics as well as writing wiki-like pages in order to define them. So, you know, you can find this knowledge either on your own personalized page. I'm speeding up a little bit here. I think it's very important that there's both a poll model and a push model that this knowledge is pushed out to teams, as you see here. It's pushed out to everyone's profile in the Active Directory. Uh, under Nestor's name, it will say what he's an expert in. It's also pushed out to every single document. You could find any term in any Word document or, or SharePoint, and just by right-clicking it, you have the smartest search 
that we have yet seen inside workplaces um, by, by truly now reasoning over those, that Microsoft graph. The last thing I want to show you here is let's just say you're having a conversation with someone and they ask you a question that you've gotten many times in the past. And, and this is a case where Emily has asked me a question and I've answered the question. But then we both realize that we need to capture that for the knowledge of our company. So just by at mentioning knowledge, um, we will include that in, in that knowledge base uh, that Project Cortex is, is collecting. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about collaborating with AI. Right. It's like, hey, knowledge, would you go ahead and capture that? Because, you know, I think that's going to come up again. OK, um, uh, you know, that that's, uh, you know, the, the end of the, the tools that I wanted to show. And I think that, you know, you can you can kind of return to um, any of any of those principles and that prediction of the preferred um, the preferred future that we want to be in. I just want to leave you with, if I can get to it really quick, I've got a little bit of a delay here. I just want to leave you with a, a, a couple of seed ideas. We're not going to be able to discuss them today, but a couple of seed ideas to seed your thinking going forward. This technology I'm showing you, it's going to solve some pains. It might also create some change and, and, and create processes. Um, and then really the question for us is, well, does this change what it means to work? Does it change what success means? But most importantly, does it change what communication leaders do to get out front of this, to know about it, and to help curate it and make sure that the company gets the most out of all this technology? Um, I'm really excited uh, to turn it over to Malavika. She has as many ideas or more as I have, and I'll see you on the chat stream. Thank you for listening.